In 2020, no cry from the radical Marxist left, Antifa and Black Lives Matter, was louder than that of abolish the police and defund the police. Today, with our two guests, we'll examine how first, mob violence is precipitated in the absence of police, and secondly, what life would actually be like without police. This is Christian Gomez, and you're watching Anarchy in America. Our first guest joining us today to discuss the breakdown of law and order giving rise to mob violence is Selwyn Duke, whose articles have been widely published both online and in print, appearing in The Hill, The American Conservative, World Net Daily, American Thinker, and who is also a contributor for The New American Magazine. Thank you for being with us, Selwyn. Thank you for having me. Terrific being with you, Christian. You recently wrote an article published on the NewAmerican.com on January 1st, 2021, entitled Anarchy NYC, 25 Strong. Now, your article also contains disturbing footage obtained by the New York Post of the teen mob attacking an SUV and BMW on the corner of 5th Avenue and West 21st Street in Manhattan. Could you briefly describe what's in the video of what took place here? Yeah, well, this mother and son, the son was middle-aged, the mother was elderly in her 70s. They were just driving along, and they were stopped by these teens. I guess maybe they were stopped at a light or something like that. And the teens attacked their vehicle, actually pounding their bikes on the vehicle. They ended up cracking the windshield. The mother was crying at one point where the report goes, they're going to kill us. So she was just scared for her life, understandably. And unfortunately, we've seen incidents like this before in recent times because we have seen so many local officials, left wing officials who have been abdicating their um, responsibility, responsibility to ensure domestic tranquility. Now, speaking of left wing officials, the, the mayor of the city, Mayor Bill de Blasio, as you know, described the attack as it's absolutely unacceptable. And, you know, you have these teenagers doing something that's just wrong, period. Uh, at least one has been arrested. The others will be. Uh, look, we got to teach our young people uh, better all the time. It's incumbent upon all of us, but we also have to have consequences. So there will be consequences in this case. I don't want to ever see anything like this happen in New York City. What's your take on the mayor's uh, comments? <laughs> yeah, well, as I said in my piece, I mean, when you say completely unacceptable, that's a very tepid way of putting it. I mean, that's how you would describe a bad appetizer that you get at a restaurant. When you're talking about teens attacking people like this in a vicious and brutal way like clockwork orange a better description is evil and that's what we should call it this is evil and when we don't stand against evil then we're not fulfilling our responsibility when we have officials who will not stand against evil and let the police quell it then we have to ask why are we paying our taxes why are we doing that at all if the government is not fulfilling its most basic responsibilities, as I said before, to ensure domestic tranquility, to enforce the borders, so on and so forth? Absolutely disgusting. Interestingly, this attack in New York occurred, you know, just eight blocks from 14th Street in Union Square, which is a hotbed for self-proclaimed communists, socialists, Occupy protesters, uh, the Antifa groups, and even a Black Lives Matter they like to demonstrate there at Union Park. Would you say this attack and others like it are the culmination of decades worth of radical Marxist and Leninist activism and influence in New York City? Yeah, you could put it that way. I mean, obviously, it's leftism, however you want to frame it, however you want to detail it. It is leftism. And what we're seeing here is... Of course, as you said, decades of this undermining of morality in the country. But also, if you want to go deeper, I mean, you have to ask, the left has been talking about defunding the police, reimagining the police. Now, obviously, if you eliminate the police or if you neuter them, anarchy will ensue or something approximating anarchy. But anarchy, Christian, is never a permanent state of affairs. Obviously, some controlling authority is going to step into the breach and restore order. So what's really going on here? Well, I'm not saying that most leftists, such as the ones on the street who are just rabble rousers, are thinking along these lines. But the bottom line is maybe some Machiavellian ones are. What would be the goal here? Well, the only reason why you would want to defund the police or neuter the police is because you want to become the police. 
And that's ultimately what the left wants to do. Remember this. The left has been very successful in seizing control over our culture. That Gramscian march, referring to Antonio Gramsci, the Italian marches, that Gramscian march through our institutions. The left controls academia, the media. It controls the entertainment realm. It controls big tech. It controls most of big business now. So it controls all the culture shapers. However, it does not control the police by and large. Most police are still basically conservative in this country, and that has not escaped the left's notice. And the bottom line is this. You can control all the aforementioned culture shapers, and that's fine. But if you really want to cement control, if you really want to impose your agenda upon the population, you have to control the boots on the ground, ergo the desire to control the police. So that's part of the agenda here, no doubt, I would say, again, among the more Machiavellian leftists, and certainly that's going to be the result if we keep going down this road. But you have to remember here, this is so, so destructive, because think about it. A lot of people will complain, well, the police are not responsive to our needs. You've heard black activists and others say, oh, well, the police are racist. But interesting about that, Christian, is that if you take, let's say, a city such as Baltimore, you had the Freddie Gray situation there five years ago, you heard the same complaints. Yet if we're going to frame this racially, as the left so often does, well, in Baltimore, you have a black mayor, you have a black police chief, you have largely black politicians elected by a population that's 63 percent black. Now, think about it here, everyone. If in that kind of a situation, again, if you're framing it racially, as the left does, if you cannot secure police that are to your liking, how is outsourcing the police function to the federal government going to be beneficial? Because in that situation, you're going to have police that are controlled by bureaucrats a thousand miles away, by a government a thousand miles away that's mostly non-black, again, framing it racially, that's been elected by a population that's 87 percent non-black. So the whole thing just defies logic all the way around. Now, of course, you don't want to ultimately, or if you can avoid it, frame this racially. But the bottom line is you want to control things as close to where you are as possible. You want as much local control as possible. That accords with the principle of subsidiarity. In other words, functions in society should be devolved to the smallest possible unit. If you control the police close to home and you have a problem with the police, maybe you can walk into the mayor's office or the police chief's office. Maybe you can vote the sheriff out of office. You can't do that when this is controlled by a bureaucracy a thousand miles away. You know, I mentioned before that the police are still generally conservative. That's even true in my town. My town is a liberal town, unfortunately, that's where I live, but I have a friend in the police department and he tells me most of the police are Republicans. And the bottom line here is also it, when you have local police like this, they often have a connection to the community, as my friend does. He was born here, I believe. He lives here. He has a stake here. He said that he doesn't want to leave, even though the liberals have seized control. When you have police who are controlled, again, a thousand miles away, they may not have that stake in the community anymore. Because if I were an autocratic leftist and I really wanted to cement my control, Christian, what would I do? I would make sure that the police that I had in a given community were not from that community, that they were from elsewhere, so they wouldn't actually have a stake in that community and a real connection to the people. So that's and that's, like, one of and the that's like what we see in the United Nations with these peacekeeping forces. I'm sort of switching gears here a little bit, but at the, yeah. the peacekeepers, they come from other countries, and of course, no surprise, all the rampant rape that we see in places like Haiti or in Africa, where you have these UN peacekeepers that are not even from an African country, so they have no stake in the claim, and that's what would, exactly what would happen. If we have maybe federal police officers from the West Coast patrolling in the East Coast where it's not their community. So these are valid points that you uh, bring up. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Sullivan. Uh, we appreciate having you today. And uh, you take care and stay safe, my friend. Thank you. And God bless you and your audience. Great being with you. Thank you. Joining us now to discuss, as is the title of her article, What Life is Like Without Police, TNA contributor Emma Freer, who's actually lived in two countries uh, without local and well-funded police. Emma, thank you so much for being with us today on the show. Thanks for having me, Christian. 
Okay, so we recently saw in Selwyn, uh, as Selwyn Duke covered in the New American, how a group of 25 teenagers were recently caught on camera lawlessly and brazenly attacking a BMW between Midtown and Lower Manhattan without a single police officer in sight in broad daylight and got away with it. Now, you lived in two countries where there, really, there essentially were no police, at least not like in the U.S. What was it like living in Brazil and South uh, Africa in terms of the lawlessness and uh, safety and crime and so forth? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that in both these countries, there's almost a complete culture of lawlessness. Such policing as there is, is extremely ineffective at handling such massive, massive volumes of crime. So as I've discovered in both these countries, the solution that middle class people have turned to is private security. It's not ideal uh, at all. Uh, a well-functioning, well-funded police department is, is a much better alternative to public safety. But Private security is what allows normal middle class people just to have a little bit of a semblance of a normal life and to at least protect their homes and their businesses. Though when you're out in public in the street, like what happens, you know, in this incident you described, that that could also certainly happen here in Brazil or or in South Africa, because there's just very little police around to to deal with a situation like that. So when the government starts to abolish police departments, consolidate them or nationalize them and then defund the few that are left. Uh, creates this, I guess, gap in in uh, in the law and order of the country. So people, as you mentioned, have, have to resort to this private security. But where does that leave? Um, is that is that an ideal situation? Like, where does that leave people who can't afford private security? Is it affordable? And um, aren't you being sort of paying twice for public safety? Yes. Yeah, it is very much a uh, suboptimal solution. I, in my article, I refer to it as a band aid on a much bigger problem. So it'll keep you relatively safe in your home and your business, but it, it doesn't address the much bigger societal problem of ineffective policing. It is relatively affordable and these um, in these countries, just there's just so much demand for protection that security firms have adapted their services to make them more widely affordable. So for example, in South Africa, in the, the small city where I lived, there was one private security company that really dominated the local market. And a basic package for them uh, with them would cost about 200 grand, which is maybe equivalent to about 13 U.S. dollars a month. So that's very affordable. Is this I, per I household or per family? How does that work? Uh, yeah, it's typically per family. So um, that would be like a, a monitored alarm plus a panic button. And then um, f up from there, you could have much, much more advanced uh, security options, at, obviously, at higher prices. Though, I don't think um, in South Africa, salaries tend to be quite low. So that's why private security would be as low as $13. But what was interesting to me is that some of my middle class friends there told me that um, they struggled to afford even that. It's just a massive burden on middle class families. And they pay twice. So once they pay taxes for police departments that are, you know, at best you know, ineffective, you know, at worst actively contributing to crime via corruption, you know, and trying to extort bribes by fraudulent uh, stop and search operations. So they, they pay the taxes to fund the non-existent police, and then they pay for the private security that actually will, you know, turn up if they have an incident at their home. And then they have to live with the many downsides of a high crime society, such as not being able to move freely in public. For a long time in Brazil, for example, we had Marxist-leaning governments with former president uh, uh, Lula da Silva and his successor, who was also pretty Marxist-leaning. And then, of course, in, in, uh, in South Africa, you've had the African National Congress in conjunction with the South African Communist Party, you know, the ANC and the South African Communist Party, basically ruling the country since uh, the early 90s. Uh, what sort of led to the current situation in these two countries that the, the, the condition of police has gotten so bad to the state that it's in? Is, is this a result of the policies from these radical leftist Marxist governments? Uh, police funding has been a very low priority in both these countries for a very long time. Uh, in South Africa, the, the, the economy is in a dismal state. You know, unemployment is currently above 30 percent. So there's just very little uh, funding um, to go around, but the police just has never been a priority since the ANC took power. They've been actively cutting the budget for years. A friend of mine put it this way, in South Africa, the police are in a natural state of defunding, which um, is very unfortunate. And yeah, also in Brazil, the, the salaries that police officers get are just incredibly low 
This is what Brazilians tell me. And to some extent, a lot of police officers are just forced to engage in corruption because they need to do that to make ends meet. And now the, the institutional framework of the police is corrupt and it's just become common practice to engage in corruption to top up your salary. And Brazil's, wow. um, yeah, Brazil's political institutions are just extremely dysfunctional as well. So I mean, just simply increasing police pay would go a long way towards improving the situation in Brazil. But the political dysfunction makes that really hard, even though uh, for President Jair Bolsonaro, the police you know, is, is one of his voting blocks. So I think this is what he would like to do. But it's it's just kind of politically impossible for him. Yeah, I mean, and they sort of call Bolsonaro, the president in Brazil, the uh, sort of the Trump of the tropics he's been referred yeah. to. As, as that. So do you see the lack of police in places like Brazil and South Africa as emboldening radical Marxist groups and Marxist politicians to impose their will on the people? Yes, absolutely. Because, um, I mean, also in these countries, uh, there's private gun ownership is very difficult to achieve. Uh, it's not, we don't have an equivalent to the Second Amendment here in Brazil or in South Africa. So they have very little fear of pushback from the population. Um, so yeah, they have they have free reign to impose their policies. Even though Bolsonaro, I think he's done his best, but I, kind of a, the comparison with Trump is quite a good one because Bolsonaro also ha has to go up against the Brazilian equivalent of the deep state. It makes it very hard for him to get anything done. Absolutely. Uh, so just one final question: uh, What do you believe Americans can and should do to prevent the United States from maybe going down the path that Brazil and South Africa have gone in terms of the lawlessness? Well, I think people need to be incredibly vigilant, um, monitor their local government, their state government, make sure that funding for the police is maintained, that respect for the police is maintained. Because, um, yeah, my experience suggests that uh, life without police is very, very hard on the middle class. Um, and, yeah, people in America are going to end up paying twice. It's unfortunate. My experience is that it you would get it used to life in a high crime society pretty quickly. I've adjusted to relying on private security for my protection, but I, I just wouldn't want that for Americans. And people need to look at places like Brazil and South Africa and realize how good we have it in the United States and not let it get that bad. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. Take care and stay safe, of course, and God bless you. Thank you, Christian. Emma Freyer gave us a gloomy outlook of what it's like to live without police in countries governed by Marxists. And what Selwyn Duke described earlier in New York is sadly becoming more and more common throughout the country. To help stop radical leftist Marxists and communists from creating anarchy in America in order to promote revolution and ultimately take over, we at the John Birch Society encourage you to join the John Birch Society and get involved in our Support Your Local Police campaign. We also encourage you to get, read, and distribute copies of the November 9, 2020 issue of The New American, which features both Selwyn Duke's cover story, Violence, Inc., A Leftist Enterprise, and Emma Freyer's article, What Life is Like Without Police. Until next week, take care, God bless, and stay safe.